Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we have our old, old friend back on the podcast, Mr. Nick White. Nick, welcome back on, man. Good to be here. Yes, it has been 200 episodes since you were on when you did a ver- very, very early episode on um, vintage uh, sound effect instruments, which is what we're here to talk about today, because Nick has the world's largest collection of these incredible wild, wacky, (laughs) very unique (laughs) instruments. So Nick, no one's going to explain it better than you. Tell us what these instruments are and what they were used for. They are percussion sound effect instruments. Um, They're not fully instruments. Uh, That's a more modern term. They are um, percussion sound effect instruments, and a lot of percussionists call them traps, which is short for contraptions. They are used for um, the everything I collect specifically was used for silent film accompaniment. You explained it great, but truly like old movie theaters, there was no sound. The science and the technology had not caught up to put sound to picture. Mm-hmm. Uh, so again, people would be sitting there like you, like you are right now, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening, Nick is sitting in the room with his incredible um, collection there'd be a train on the screen. You would be creating a train sound with something that we're going to see today. There'd be a gunshot. Then there'd be a gunshot, uh, a a surefire machine or whatever it's called, something (laughs) like that. Um, but that went away in 1927, correct? Yes. It slowly phased out. It wasn't like night and day. Uh, but, um, they, uh, they invented, uh, something called a, a Vitaphone, but there was different technologies for adding sound. It eventually became printing the sound onto the film next to the actual negative of the film, which made mm. it impossible for them to be separated because they're on the same film together. Yeah. But uh, it's we take for granted how hard that is and how sure. uh, jarring it is when uh, the sound of someone talking is just a fraction of a millisecond off, you know, it can actually give people vertigo to watch that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, really. It's bizarre. And it, it's like, like, well, like I've get gotten that with the podcast or something you download and it's slight, it's, it's five frames off and it's like, wow, that is something's wrong. Like I have to re, un, undo it and redo it. And, um, and it's, it's a mess, but, um, so to jump in here, Nick, why don't we start? There's a whole bunch of stuff to talk about. First off, just as a kind of a cliffhanger. Nick was in the recent uh, Martin Scorsese movie, uh, Killers of the Flower Moon, in a really cool scene towards the end with our friend uh, Paul Wells was actually in the same scene as the drummer. And you guys didn't really know each other until that. But we'll talk about all that. I want to get to that after because I don't want to like, you know, there's there's tons to talk about there but for starters now nick do you want to maybe give us like a presentation of some of maybe your your favorite instruments and the 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 classics and and you know because you do this a lot i can't wait to hear more about what you do with them and the the performances yeah. that you do it's it's really cool these are living breathing instruments um i learn more about them by using them and uh one thing i learned by using them is um just like drum set playing you try to have both your feet and both your hands moving at all at the same time. A lot of times I'll have to make two sounds at once. And so the more that an instrument can be one handed, the better. So I'm going to start with all the kind of cranked instruments. If you can make it dumber and easier, that's even better too. If you can just make it like all I have to do is turn the crank. That's great. Cause especially when you perform in the dark, it, it helps to just feel the crank and turn it. So, Uh, One of my favorite instruments that one of my students calls the coffee grinder is um, the Wahlberg and Ange company's uh, auto imitation. And it is basically a little metal maraca inside this big wooden box. And it has a, a geared crank. And you have to imagine an old Model T car. This instrument's from 1917. So... I'll give you that, and I'll give you the horn as well. (laughs) And it even has um, 
I used this in the, the last show I did, an ability to make the sound sound like it's going farther away and closer. By opening and closing, closing this. Yeah. So that is the coffee grinder. While you're on that one, I, I'll just throw out there that it makes you think that like that would be very topical of the time because these the cars were like relatively new and they're featured in movies where now <coughs> movies are like there's like AI in movies because that's in the news all the time. So like the sound effects would match what was like popular in in media at that time. Yeah, uh, we just did a Harold Lloyd movie that was um, that was just car chases the entire movie. Uh, so cool. an instrument that I made is the glass crash machine <laughs> and it's not an antique but i copied it exactly from the catalog luckily the catalog gave its dimensions and you built this i built this wow because uh, i needed the sound and i couldn't find the genuine article um so i'll just give you that sound So uh, some, awesome. an, an audience member just asked me what's inside there. And I was like, it's what you hear. It's filled with glass. So um, one of the rare items, uh, it's made by the Barry Drum Company, um, is this um, dog bark effect. And they made it into a crank. A normal dog bark um, would just be this tiny tin drum with a string. And um, you have to pull on the string. But they made it into a cranked instrument where you just turn the crank like this. It's a little bit of a smaller dog sound, but I, yeah. I, I used it for kind of a yappy dog in the last show. So that's very that's con awesome. convenient. Yeah. Uh, what else is cranked? I have, um, I'm going to call this the rarest thing I own. Um, it's a Ludwig and Ludwig um, auto imitation, which according to the catalogs almost didn't exist. They, uh, they showed a picture of it one time in 1915. Um, and I think the reason they didn't make it is because it doesn't sound very good. Um, you have to crank it really fast. The other one has a, like a double gear system so that one crank is twice the motion. This one doesn't have that. But um, that is the yeah. rarest thing I have. It's just wow. a, a box with a board that flaps up and down inside. And it almost sounds like a machine gun instead of a car. Yeah, like it almost could be repurposed as something else. The <laughs> other one definitely sounded better. But the rarity of that is super cool. Yeah, it's just all right. What else is cranked? Um, ratchets are certainly cranked, but that's that's more of a drummer's item. This ratchet actually says, "I'll show you up, up close." This ratchet actually says "Trap Drummer," the guy's name, and I love that. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so the other category is kind of friction drums. A friction drum is a dog bark, like I showed you. And it is basically a drum with a calfskin head and a string that goes through it. And that string is covered in violin rosin to give it that friction. And then when you pull some canvas over it, it makes the high pitch sound. And the bigger you make um, that drum, the deeper the pitches. So I'll show you. Um, my Ludwig lion's roar, which is a drum, but it's squared, which actually kind of helps you put it on the table. Sure. And when you pull the string on this, it sounds like a lion. That's awesome. And, Man. um, the lion's roar is harder to find. The most common thing is you can find these, uh, dog barks all the time and they usually didn't come on a frame like that other one was made by Leedy. this one they would just kind of hang to the roof of the theater pit uh, underneath the stage or they would attach it to the wall somehow 
and they would just pull on it when they needed it. Hmm. Very cool. And those are more common, you said? Yeah, that was a, a very common uh, track back then. Cool. And um, other things um, in terms of convenience, um, I can segue into the transportation kind of thing, the trains, is um, the Ludwig. A lot, of, a lot of drummers know what these are now. Um, Ludwig and Ludwig, starting in 1913, started making um, their train imitation. Now, previously, uh, going back in like 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, when you wanted to make a train sound, it was always with sheet metal. This is one with sheet metal made by Walberg and Auger. The, the simplest way, would they would just get sheet metal and be it with something, and that would yeah. be pretty convincing. Yeah, with a visual aid, you got to remember that you're seeing this <laughs> with it on the screen. Yeah, and so, yeah. Um, so um, in 1913, when they started making these, it doesn't have any sheet metal in it, and they advertise that you don't have to beat sheet metal flat anymore. Like every time it gets crinkled up in your trap case, you don't have to like flatten it out. And yeah. I guess that was a problem for people. Uh, it makes it sound like this. Sounds great. That metal in particular, the bell is very trainy, you know? Yeah. Um, you gotta have the full effect. And, um, yeah. I have, uh, like there's three or four different ways you can make a train imitation. Um, Walberg and Auger, uh, made these and Lady uh, marketed them. This is kind of like a cheese grater with a big, big brush on it. And this is obviously the more portable version. Yeah. Less portable version, which they advertise for large theaters. Other transportation, um, obviously, the oldest form of transportation is horse hooves. I can show those up close. And I even have the horse itself. <laughs> Good and then horse. you go... And, uh, Started off fast there. <laughs> I just did a film that had um, a carriage with two horses, and it was really dramatic. And so I put two in each hand, and I go, oops, I actually use another pair of these. I have doubles of everything, Bart. Nice. <laughs> um Very cool. Is it normally, uh, well, I mean, I'll, you know, I'm going to try and save my questions, but is it normally just one drummer per theater or does they, do they sometimes double up? Uh, it depended on budget and, and size, okay. but, um, for really, um, large scale films, like, um, there's one documentation of, um, a giant battle scene where they hired an entire group of people behind the screen with swords making the sounds of the swords fighting and everything like that. Wow. And, um, but it was more common for one drummer to kind of be in charge of everything. And um, what I'm jealous of is drummers back then would kind of be a permanent fixture in the theater. They would kind of be in the corner of the theater pit. If you're not familiar with that, it's kind of just underneath the stage, but enough to see the stage. And um, they would just kind of be 
living there. I have uh, one photo where uh, he has a sign on all his stuff, please don't touch my stuff, because <laughs> it, it's living there overnight. So I'll get into uh, boat whistles. Um, old catalogs showed a ridiculous amount of variety of train and boat whistles, and I'll just try to get through as many as I can. Sure. Um, this is the ocean liner. Um, this is a, uh, this is kind of cool. It says uh, duplex on there. This is a uh, steamboat. Generally boats are, are lower pitched, but they also made a, um, a tugboat. You have to really be a nautical expert to know the difference between these sounds. Uh, the tugboat is a little bit smaller than the ocean liner. This one's yeah. made by Leedy. Some guy in the audience is like, hey, that's not a tugboat. <laughs> <laughs> if he's watching a movie. But um, I have another steamboat. This is a, a deep cut. If people are familiar with the Ward Drum Company, they were in Gary, Indiana, and they Okay. Kind of went out of business around 1920, so they're. Really cool. A lot of harmonics going on there. Yeah. They made different portable ones. This one's just two pitch. It was made by a uh, Gretsch company. Um, the more obscure the company, the better. This one was made by the uh, Acme Drum Company, which was in New Jersey. Do these have like one is better than the other sound wise? Is there a better wood? Is there one you like the most? Because, I mean, to me, coming through the mic and the room and the headphones, they all sound sort of similar. Oh, yeah. Um, this one sounds the best to me. I, I like this one a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, everything could be done badly. <laughs> um, That's true. Uh, some of them, um, you know, they're just not, they're not well made. Um, sure. The most popular selling one back then, and I'll, I'll show it up close on the camera a little bit, is the uh, Ludwig 4-on-1, which had these switches where you could turn off one of the pitches or turn two of them on and one of them off. And you could also tune each pitch high wow, or low very well engineered so like i mentioned uh s like steamboats and, and and boats in general are the lower pitches and the higher pitches are train whistles uh you could tune it up to be a train and you could tune it down to be a steamboat And then the coolest part is um, a lot of music at that time actually had a cuckoo, like a cuckoo whistle written into it. That was more kind of a novelty and kind of a, a thing back then. It was also in operas too. Uh, if you turn off two of the switches and just keep on the top one, and there's a little oh. tone hole there that you, when you close it, it lowers the pitch. So these yeah, were really popular. Everything. Yeah, you could yeah. have you could have four whistles in one. Less stuff on your table, <laughs> less stuff you have to carry. That's kind of the name, seems like the name of the game. Yeah, um, I can get into the whole thing about portability. Um, a lot of times people say like, oh, can't you make that sound by bringing in like a bicycle and uh, spinning the wheel or something? And, and I was like, everything's got to be, you know, around my hands and nearby. I can't be running around like, you know, and I'm also traveling. Yeah. So, you know, I'm living the life of a, of a trap drummer back then. I'm, I'm like packing all this stuff up and going yeah. somewhere. So uh, I'm not bringing a bicycle. Um, yeah. If you want to get into cuckoo whistles, as everyone wants to these days. I do, yes. <laughs> um, a lot of them actually had pitches so you could tune them because some music actually uh, will be in like the key of, of D major and it'll say which pitches the cuckoo should be sounding. And it, it, it still happens in opera these days. And um, if you want to see what Ludwig also made, 
a um i can show you that decal there which is my favorite yeah that is awesome the gold decal yeah I love um that. If you didn't buy the foreign one, you could just buy the cuckoo by itself. Turn it down. And uh, similar whistles was um, a quail whistle, which is actually, I'm doing research on this. There was music around 1900 that asked you to play this. If you want to get into animals, um, instruments like this, um, which are basically a duck call. It has a reed. If you don't know what a reed is, it is a little thin piece of brass that vibrates. In a clarinet, they have like a wooden reed, but it's basically what makes the sound. It's vibrating. All of these have reeds, and they're, and they're very similar to what our, our duck calls are actually. Uh, but this one is made by Ludwig, and it's a rooster. Is there crossover, but like you said, duck calls, is there crossover between guys who would just go hunting? I mean, they probably wouldn't buy a Ludwig one. They'd buy like whatever hunting brand. No, uh, some companies just sold a um, an actual duck call. But the distinction is that drum companies were making their own things just for that purpose. Yeah, sure. Um, and I have to convince people on eBay that it, it's not a duck call. It's a Ludwig and yeah. Ludwig instrument. Uh, a baby not cry duck dynasty or something. <laughs> a baby cry is a. Um, it's kind of a comedy sound. <laughs> and um, another comedy sound. Um, believe it or not, I've played more than one silent film where the guy, like you know, crashes his car into a chicken coop and he leaves. And there's chickens all over him, and the audience just cracks up when you go. Yeah. This was made by the Duplex Company. The oldest things I own um, are made by a company called Charles Stone, and he was just a guy in Chicago. And it was really the turn of the century, like 1900 to 1906. And, um, he made this quail call and he also uh, made this one sheep call. And it just, it just says, you can see up close. It just says sheep. <laughs> <laughs> so that's good. Uh, or you could be blowing your nose. <laughs> <laughs> I would say all of these are more for comedy than being realistic. I have um, another one made by Ward, and these all break in two for portability. Okay. This is a cow imitation. And they even sold, this is made of wood, it's a little bit different, but it's a calf imitation. And how do you know that? It just says calf right there. Yeah. So that's great. I imagine your wife hearing these noises and you're like, I'm practicing. <laughs> oh, it's my cats that don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the things I play with are for comedy. Um, there are times, especially with things like the glass crash or another instrument I have, which is a wind machine. It's actually uh, one of the cooler things I have. It can't be in the house because it's so big. It's in a storage unit. Um, but it is a hand cranked machine that makes the sound of wind and a hand cranked machine below it that makes the sound of rain. Uh, those were used very effectively in silent movies where there was a giant monsoon and you're actually creating tension by providing this loud, uncomfortable sound. But a lot of these things are actually used for comedies. Um, the origins of the, the word slapstick comedy come from the slapstick, which this is uh, a Ludwig one and you just whip it like that. And, um, and would that be like, you know, the three stooges kind of slapping each other kind of thing or just, yeah. Various, um, yeah. I also use my drum set for a lot of funny sounds. Um, I use a China symbol underneath a, um, 10 inch symbol and it kind of makes a funny, 
Yeah. You can just imagine a guy getting slapped in the face and falling to the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, or a guy throwing something and getting hit in the face. You know, yeah. a lot of that is just comedy sound. Um, and you can even use the ratchet as a comedy sound. A lot of times if someone, if you're making an uncomfortable sound of someone getting their nose twisted off or oh, something, yeah. you can use that. And um, these weren't made by drum companies, but the holder was made by a drum company. Um, this is mm. called a squawker. They were invented to be duck calls, but um, drummers figured out that they're kind of useful. It kind of makes a frog kind of cricket. But I've used it for times where, you know, uh, there was a movie where a cat got stuck in a glue trap, you know, like a rat glue trap, and that like yeah. sticky, uncomfortable sound, you know. Oh, yeah, that's so awesome. It's kind of hard to explain what things are for, but when they're used right, they're they're perfect. Um, yeah. I also use a cowbell. Um, for people who are more into um, drums, I use a very um, utilitarian drum set from that era. Um, I never saw a photo of a silent film trap drummer with the temple blocks and a million Tom Toms or anything like that. Um, very simple. Um, I, I really think we can get it. It's a different topic, but most uh, drummers from that era were using a kit like this and not, you know, something with a painted bass drum head and flashy yeah, colors. And yeah. that, that was more marketing. But, um, mm. you know, I just keep a cowbell and like a lot of the photos, the cowbell is just sitting on a, a piece of cloth. <laughs> There's nothing fancy. Sure. So a lot of, a lot of slapstick comedy is just right yeah. there with this in my mouth and get my left hand. Hmm. Nice. So that's what makes me a drummer who plays sound effects and not some sort of sound effect technician or foley artist as, as they call it sometimes if you get rid of the drum set then that's not you're just really more doing foley yeah. and sound effects yeah yeah that's true um i don't know how interesting this will be to everyone but i love this topic it's kind of a recent discovery of mine i found a newspaper article from 1895 i think um and it describes sound effect instruments like this being used in, um, in a band. When I say band, I mean like a, a concert band, you know, with, with trumpets, trombones, tuba. And what I found really interesting right away is, okay, here's sound effect instruments, but film isn't even invented yet. So I didn't know that. I didn't know that a lot of these instruments predated film itself. So wow. what the article described is that, um, D during a play or an opera, a lot of times it was play or vaudeville, they would have the band play during the intermission and just to kind of keep people entertained. And the most popular of that entertaining music usually had some sort of theme. Like it would be like spring day among the roses or something like that. And, um, or the birds chirping in the trees. They would have some kind of theme to the name. And the drummer would be there and they would add sound effects to kind of paint that picture. And the audiences found that really amusing. And it was a novelty that, you know, we're not listening to, uh, you know, strict classical music here. We're listening to something with novelty instruments. It was more entertaining. So if they're playing a piece that, you know, is called, you know, um, the, the birds in the bush, it might have. And I've seen drum parts from around before 1900 that will have you playing snare drum stop for a measure go back to drums have you play the wood block for 10 measures and then play quail whistle and as weird as that sounds by modern standards um i've found evidence that the, all these instruments were even before film wow and so when you say trap Trap drummer, um, as I've studied through these articles, didn't mean um, 
sound effect instruments. It didn't mean a guy with sound effect instruments. Um, trap literally meant um, a drummer playing more than one instrument. And there's even um, evidence that the word trap means gear. I've, I've heard in, in um, references to the word trap before, and it's just talking about gear, like a bunch of stuff. And yeah, so sure. um, the word trap drummer came along as literally um, a combination of a bass drummer and a snare drummer. So a guy doing many instruments at once, that meant trap drummer. So to clarify, yeah. it doesn't mean that you had sound effects per se, but a lot of drumming back then just had train whistles involved with it. I did finish, um, I got through with December, <laughs> where as a percussionist, we play a lot of slave up. And that's just part of being yeah. a drummer. You might play something with a winter theme or a Christmas theme. I've played multiple movies where it's very important that the phone is ringing. Somebody's calling. And I have an electric. Ah. Bell set from there. And um, this is actually was designed to be a bicycle bell. But this is also meant to be a doorbell. Yeah, which is important. It's and then the lady goes, "Oh my gosh, who's at my house?" and she panics or something. You know, yeah. When yeah, the film doesn't have, have the sound of a, a telephone ringing, you just see people going like this, and it's a little confusing. Um, yeah, and that gets into the deeper topic of why it's important to have sound effects. And I've often had to convince people who are throwing a silent film festival that they need me, and I have to make arguments like that. You know, like without it, it can be very confusing. Yeah. But um, let me try to show a few more things. Sure. Uh, I do have some instruments from Killers of the Flower Moon that we can talk about later. I think one of the more impressive items is this car horn. And I've often had to create um, the sound of a streetcar. I would use a harder mallet than this, but I have it on my wall here. And I think I'll finish with the smallest thing I own, which was made by um, Wahlberg and Auger. Yep. And it hooks onto your bass drum and it makes the sound of a telegraph. Oh, cool. And you can't quite see, but it has a little Wal Wahlberg and Auger um, logo on it. And you hook it up to your bass drum. And you... It's a very specific if, sound, and it's very yeah. tiny, so finding it is, is impossible. But that would be common then with like sending, if there was like a war movie or something, or, or something where they, they were typing more, doing Morse code or something, or sending a telegraph. I mean, I guess that's... It, that it's a little common. obscure, because I almost don't even think that you need to hear that sound when you're watching somebody... <laughs> operate one of those machines but i i suppose if you yeah. if you wanted to add it it was there it was an extremely cheap thing to buy so i imagine people got them for the 30 cents or that it was yeah. for sale this is another odd thing um it actually came with my train imitation and my train whistle um so i know it was used by a sound effect drummer and um i always use this as a comedy sound for uh, i'll show you oh yeah I always kind of a I, pie pie tin. Yeah, I call it the frying pin, and I almost always use it for like a clown in a cartoon that's dangling off a cliff. <laughs> and it always makes people laugh. So. Yeah, yeah. I remember watching a documentary and hearing that I think is worth noting, and you probably, I'm sure, are well aware of this, but. Everyone always says 1927. I guess uh, the jazz singer was like the first to talky, but I, I guess 1926 is it Don Juan was the first film to have a soundtrack like music with the Vitaphone Corporation, you know, mixing the two together. So it kind of predates that, but that's not really talking. So it loses its. Yeah, it's kind of like when people say the first car was a Model T, you know, they don't yeah. mean it's the first one or like Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. It's kind of yeah. we've simplified history. Um, yes. Uh, I'm not. An, total expert on this, but I, I know I've seen um, 
earlier than 1927 documentaries, but um, with people who were, were experimenting with different ways to sync sound. But uh, Jazz Singer was the the Al, the Al Jolson film that really um, made a name for him and was the first really, really big hit film with sound. Yes. It's just interesting, too, because we are we like movie stuff. It had Don Juan, 1926, had John Barrymore, who is Drew Barrymore's like great, great, great grandpa <laughs> or something, which is pretty neat. So um, anyway, getting back to this, two questions that come to mind that I just want to ask you before we get to the Killers of the Flower Moon stuff. Um, you can pick either or either one. I'll, maybe I'll just tell you both of them and you can kind of touch on both. Is First would be the the engineering behind creating these is anything known about that and then also i want to hear you talk about um how you notate things for when you do these silent movie pictures Mm -hmm. well um the amount of engineering that went into these were kind of ridiculous um i think what i find most interesting about the engineering is that they were going through a lot of trouble to make one instrument. And so it it tells me that there was a demand for that instrument. And it tells me that it was important because, you know, nowadays a train whistle, if you buy one at a store, it's like a really cheap little kind of piece of junk. And so um, when you see the Ludwig and Ludwig foreign one, which was like the most um, engineered, but beautifully made um, train whistle, um, Not all of them, but um, a couple from an earlier era. They didn't, a lot of these were glued together and they didn't, a train whistle will start to sound bad when that glue kind of like starts to crack open over time. Excuse me. And um, if the seams kind of crack open, it just won't make no sound at all. And so they knew this and um, they carved this one out of one big block of wood like instead of making four walls they like carved out kind of a canoe shape for each of these tones and then just kind of glued a top on it to kind of reduce the chance that um anything would come apart and um you can kind of see that they were just kind of carefully sliding it over a bandsaw and you can see all these bandsaw marks in there they're, they're circular you can see that someone really skilled had to like back and forth very carefully do this over a bandsaw and that they didn't have anything like a router back then. Um, and so, uh, doing, making this on a bandsaw is really, (laughs) it's a, it's an impressive skill. And, um, these tuners, I can take one of them out. Sometimes I call them plungers for changing the pitch. They have this beautifully turned, maple ornate end to them and so it just kind of shows you where their priorities lie um obviously things were just made better in general back then yeah that's like houses everything was was lathed and beautifully (laughs) ornate and it's like that's not the case anymore yeah i mean obviously um if you do the conversion rate um the ludwig foreign one was kind of expensive close to a hundred dollars and um a lot of these, like the wind machine, the conversion rate of it was, I think it was $12 or $24 or something like that. When you convert that from 1910 till now, it's over a thousand dollars. And so, um, wow. you can, you can tell that, you know, either the, either the theater or the drummer were investing in something that they took seriously. And, um, none of these were meant to be toys. Um, and there was clearly a demand, um, I have to create demand in 2024, but, um, <laughs> but, yeah. um, there was clearly a demand and, um, some audiences liked their movies with sound effects and some theaters just didn't use them at all. Um, but, um, mm. but film was a huge boom in the 1910s, um, the twenties, of course, but it really took off after 1912 and, um, and I think people were just trying to go with the craze. Yeah. I will refer people as well back to Nick's original episode, episode 27, which I 
I've forgotten more from that. I'm probably asking some of the same questions, but it's 200 episodes ago. So I know more now. I've, yeah, I've sure, done more research and I, I know a lot more than I did then. I've I also done, I don't mean to get off topic. I've done a lot of photographic research and I have a lot of them on my walls here. This is blown up, but this is um, a double exposure of a man in the corner. And it's kind of showing his complete outfit. Back then, they called it an outfit. You could call it a setup these days. Um, he wouldn't call it a drum set back then. But you can see um, he's got a very elementary uh, drum set, kind of like a 26-inch bass drum with one of those really kind of primitive bass drum pedals. He's got a, only a china cymbal, which was common. And he's just got a snare and a bass. And um, he's got a glockenspiel. And he's got a huge assortment of sound effects. He's got a table and attached to the table, he's made two kind of cranked bingo barrels. And if you've been watching already, you've seen my glass machine. It's just a kind of a bingo barrel crank. And so I imagine one of them was filled with glass and the other one was filled with peas or something to make the sound of rain. And mm. um, it's got a Chinese tom-tom. In the far corner, he has a huge wind machine. And on top of it, he has a, another huge lion's roar. So I can tell wow. from that, especially, that he was a um, silent film drummer and not just a, an average drummer. An average drummer did not have a wind machine or a lion's roar necessarily. He's got a dog bark. He's got a gun. For um, That's the easiest way to make the sound of a gun. Uh, firing blanks yeah. Um, yeah. and even little duck calls, baby cries. He, he's just got everything. And um, this used to be a rarity that I would find a photo like this, but I've found more and more. I found one from Chicago that was a postcard and the back of the postcard was telling his sister, Hey, this is a photo of me in the movie theater. And uh, I can make any sound from a lion's roar to a bird whistle and, and you'd be so proud of me. And, you know, and it's, it's like the Rosetta Stone for me. Like, okay, this is proof, you know, that in 1912, they were going this far. And um, it shows him just at the base of the movie theater screen. He's next to a piano and he's just got all this stuff. Wow. So uh, the second question, how do you notate this kind of thing if, if you're doing a silent movie project? I, I kind of invented it in 2018 when I did my first silent film. But um, I've always wondered how they did it back in the day. But I can tell you how I did, how I did it. I would just take a, a, make a chart on the computer uh, with two columns. One column it describes what's in the scene. Man falls down. Mm -hmm. And right next to it is the instrument that you'll play for that. It's very simple. Sure. When the man falls down, you do this. And I'll write down, uh, you know, someone gets punched in the face four times. And uh, I'll write the instrument, slapstick four times. You know? <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> It's, it's quite simple, um, but a lot of times the film, especially if it's a cartoon, um, there's so much so fast that I have, the, I have a stand there with a, with a light where I can kind of reference, but um, a lot of times I'll have to memorize it. You it's, just practice a lot. I have to yeah. practice it a lot and, and, and memorize it. Um, and I've always wondered how they did it back in the day. I've only found one article that referenced it. And it, um, it's different than I perform exactly like they did, but I don't prepare like they did. I have a laptop and I watch the movie and pause whenever I want and take notes and I kind of study it. But back then they didn't have that option of pausing the film. And, um, I found one reference from like 1911 that said that, um, you should show up early in the morning and ask the projectionist to run it through a couple times. And maybe they would take notes yeah. or maybe they would just memorize. And um, that takes real skill because a lot of this stuff has to sync really well. And if you, 
when something is coming, like a train hitting a car, it happens like that. And if you miss it, it you're, you're too late. And yeah. so um, you have to really know when something's coming. And I'm, you know, really impressed that they could watch a movie once and then be ready to perform it that night, you know? Well, but movies would have been shorter, correct? Like a much, much, much shorter than a three hour plus movie, such as the movie <laughs> you were in. So yeah. I um, guess that helps a little bit. Yeah. Uh, films back then were two different categories, a short or a feature and a short um, would usually be like two reels. Um, they kind of measured it by how many times you had to change the reel. And uh, a lot of the Buster Keaton slapstick comedies were two real 20 minute comedies, um, but filled with sounds. Um, yeah. And then features could be any, you know, there were long ones, but typically uh, movies back then, if they were a feature, were about an hour, an hour and a half. And um, you might be sitting for a long time before you need to make a sound effect because there might be dialogue, just constant, you know, a lot of dialogue and then the big hurricane scene at the end of the movie. So, um, yeah, that, that I could, you know, prepare less for, but, um, yeah, a 20 minute comedy or sometimes a five minute cartoon, a five minute cartoon can have, um, a hundred sound effects in it. So, um, Jeez. it's, it's a lot. And, um, yeah. yeah. And just kind of, cause like people might be thinking the same thing I thought without putting myself in that time period, lots of dialogue would all be just captioned subtitle mm -hmm. on the bottom. Mm -hmm clearly because to say there's a lot of dialogue in a silent movie is sort of like in 2024. Now our brains are kind of like, wait, but <laughs> there's no, <laughs> there can't be. Not, not literal dialogue, but um, yeah, yes. you can tell yes. the two characters are just speaking to each other and there's no there's birds text. or train crashes or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Nick, as we get close to the end here, something that you have recently done, which uh, is just incredible. And I, I have seen the movie, but you have a, very, I mean, a pretty big part in the end sequence of Killers of the Flower Moon, the recent Martin Scorsese movie with um, Leonardo DiCaprio, Robert De Niro, a bunch of other actors are in it. Um, Paul Wells <laughs> as well, who you guys are up up there with the big stars. Um, tell us about that experience, man. What what happened? And then maybe talk about your scene. Yeah, um, it all started um, with um, an email to my website, uh, which is not that often. Uh, if you're out there, I encourage you to email me and say hi, because I get like three emails per year on my website. Um, and um, it was just a very polite email that said, you know, you know we're making a movie. Um, I think they had the name of the movie in there, but you know, we're making a, a movie in, in Oklahoma and my job is to find uh, props for the film. And, um, we're in need of these vintage sound effect instruments uh, for the film. And if you're interested in either selling or renting them, you know, please let us know. And it was just very cut and dry, very polite. And uh, the, the crazy part of the story is that I didn't really think much of that email. I, I was biased. I said, I don't think they make very big important movies in Oklahoma actually now now I learn now that they've made several uh, just yeah. just lately but I, I thought like it can't be a real serious movie if it's kind of like made in Oklahoma uh, maybe it's a small student film I don't know I don't know who these people are and um, I didn't respond to the email <laughs> oh boy so um, I, I think I, I, I plan to eventually. But I didn't respond right away. And, and 48 hours later, um, they emailed again and they said, um, hi again, Nick. Like, we really hope that you um, um, found our last email. And um, uh, again, the movie is called Killers of the Flower Moon. And uh, please get back to us. And so I said, okay, let's, let's, it sounds like an obscure name when you first hear it. Yeah. And so I said, okay, let's Google search, you know, the name of this movie. The first thing that pops up is Robert De Niro and Leonardo DiCaprio and Martin Scorsese's face. Oh my god! Like, and, oh boy! And I, like I was, I was in my car. I was like, "Oh my god!" I, I immediately replied, um, yeah. and they were very nice about it. Um, everything was super humble. Um, they didn't say we're big hotshots or anything like that. Um, 
So my first contact was a guy who was just looking for props. And um, the more I got into talk with him and, and with um, some of the producers, um, I was basically saying, you know, I don't really rent out these instruments um, for anyone else's use. And um, if you want the instruments, your best bet is to hire me to play them on screen, uh, which is a very brave move on my part just to be like, yeah. cast me. But it's true. Um, yeah. It was true. I, if, you, if you're going to have somebody uh, playing these instruments, um, it would be really difficult for me to teach an actor to play these instruments. Um, so why not just use me? And they told me, okay, uh, send photos of all four sides of your body toe to head. And it would be great if you could get those to us in the next half an hour, we're going to show them to Marty. And I was like yeah. that Marty and the big Marty. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is all in my memory, but I'm, I'm pretty positive. That's what they, they said. And it sounds right. T- terrified me. And, uh, I dressed up in a suit. <laughs> I was, telling my wife to how to hold the camera. Oh, don't hold it like that. I was, it's for Marty. I was sweating. They told me do this in half an hour. We had to move our kitchen table so that we had like a backdrop, like a clean wall as a backdrop. Um, and we were just running around like crazy. And, um, I sent them the four pictures of all sides of me and I didn't hear back for a grueling, like three days. And I was thinking, Oh man, they, Maybe they don't like that I'm like losing my hair or something. I, <laughs> it was making me feel really bad about myself. Like, oh, is oh, something I'm, about yeah. my appearance like I'm sure not 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 good enough or something? But oh. um, that, that's just a me issue that you know oh, everyone no, goes through. Every right? guy, everyone has. And yeah. as a musician, we're not used to our uh, appearance being judged for something. You know, we're just used to yeah. you know how do you play? Um, so they got back. And uh, there's a voicemail on my phone uh, that I saved that says, you know, all the details. And then it says, well, it sounds like you're going to be a cast member in the film. <laughs> wow. And, you know, I was just I jumping up and down. I was working at a, a swim school just to get by at that time. <laughs> And I had to run back to my classes and just take a break to hear this voicemail. And it was the most obscure thing. I ran out of, you know, I, during my 10 minute break, I would talk to a producer from London <laughs> and then go back to teaching a four year old how to swim. It was very <laughs> obscure. And the true Hollywood um, uh, kind of story right there. Wow. The hard thing about um, doing something like this um, pre production like two years before anyone will see it is that people think you're crazy. I had to tell my boss, you know, there's someone from a movie calling me and they'd be like, Oh, all right. All right. (laughs) Whatever, man. And for the longest time I was telling people that, you know, I'm going to be in a Martin Scorsese movie and they were like, all right, no, Nick got hired to like, you know, ride a bicycle in the background somewhere. You know, you know, I've heard a story like that before. It wasn't until I think 2022 in February that we filmed it. And it, it got delayed a lot. This was during COVID. And um, they had originally flown me out. Uh, this is the cool thing about big budget things. They um, they mentioned that, you know, if you're going to be in the 30s, you can't have a buzz cut. I had a buzz cut at the time. And they said, uh, we we're going to have to try on different wigs for you. Um, and they, they say things that only movie people say. They're like, um, you know, how's tomorrow? Can we fly you out in the morning tomorrow? <laughs> and I didn't fly out in the morning tomorrow, but uh, they flew me out right away. And um, they had a rental car ready for me at the airport to drive to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, where they just had this huge caravan of trailers. And they were filming the movie in what looked like 1900s, early 1900s aircraft hangars made out of brick. I, sound stages, basically. Yeah, they, they, they had turned wow. aircraft hangars into sound stages. And um, I sat with a really nice lady who was, uh, her name was Kay, who was trying on different wigs with me. And they were going to fly me out on the same day. Fly me in, fly me out. 
And so uh, she was frantically trying to find, you know, uh, hair pieces to put on me <laughs> that fit. And that, that was a whole issue. They, uh, they have to measure your head by putting saran wrap on your head and taping the saran wrap. And I was only there for a few hours. So they um, had the entire props team, which is like seven people around me, interviewing me with questions about different sound effects. What is this? Is it, oh, it's a train whistle? Okay, all right. They had a binder with photos from my website being like, all right, oh, what, what sound does this make? Would that be used in radio days? Oh, okay, all right. You know, and I, because it was only two hours and it was lunchtime, they also had me eating. <laughs> they brought me like this beautiful salmon to eat. Wow, and so I'm having wrapped in saran wrap my head, salmon. my head's wrapped in saran wrap. I'm eating salmon. And there's like a team of people who I'm just meeting for the first time, like barraging me with detailed questions and then Showbiz, jump, baby. jump in a rental car and fly back. It was like, it was crazy. Um, wow. So it was delayed, delayed, delayed again. So they said, okay, just grow your hair out and we'll comb it like the 30s. So the wig was never (laughs) needed. Um, But uh, it it turned out to be a great story. Um, Yes, yes. So um, without being too long, um, we filmed the radio scene in uh, Martin Scorsese's high school, which was a Catholic high school in the Bronx, Cardinal Hayes High School. And um, they chose it because it had a convincingly 1930s, 1940s stage. Hmm. And um, they built the sound booth for the radio engineers. They brought in original ribbon microphones from the RCA era. And um, they dressed us all, of course. And um, we had spent months on Zoom meetings with the production team to design a 1930s radio studio that would look realistic. Not just a bunch of props scattered around. They wanted it to look really authentic. And you're like a consultant. You're not yeah. just a guy standing there pretending to like play a trumpet or whatever. Or, or I mean, it sounds like they're, they actually, they are real musicians in this case, but mm-hmm. you are beyond just a actor performer you are a consultant yes i mean I, i'm not i'm not credited as one but i was consulting we were doing zoom meetings and yep. um so we we designed that scene uh we rehearsed at steiner studio steiner studios in brooklyn and um that was the first time that scores as he came in and, and he you know came up and um he came up to me and we we met we shook hands and um he just started pointing to instruments on the table, demonstrate that. What sound does that make? Um, incredibly detailed for a director making a three and a half hour movie to, yeah. to care about like, what sound does, does this make? What, what sound does that make? All right. All right. Interesting. Uh, is that period correct? You know, really great questions. And um, there was another sound effect man as well, who was actually a modern day Foley artist. So he had the skills. Uh, but I was teaching him a little bit. And uh, one of the funnier things is like my coffee grinder, um, the uh, the car imitation. He was like, oh, play that for me. And he goes, ah, uh, sounds a little bit like a, like a projector to me. <laughs> and he, was, he was just kind of like, you know, yeah. making, making these, uh, you know, observations about these sounds and whether they sounded sure. real or not, which is really cool. Yeah, um, yeah. we rehearsed it and we, um, we filmed it with these, um, some props were made. Um, they had a giant wooden gravel pit, which was not only made, but made to look old and aged and stained and scuffed up to look like it was used filled with like gravel for fully for fully like walking more of a something. Foley type of thing. And they yeah. use that in radio a lot. And we had sent photos from books of, of exactly what, you should make it look like. And um, it was cut from the movie, but there was a scene of me uh, with huge manacle chains on my hands, stomping in the gravel, trying to sound like a prisoner in a prison yard. And um, other another cool prop that I actually made, because if you haven't noticed, um, I have silent film stuff, and this is radio. And so... They used a couple of these things in the radio era, but 
I also had to make things. Radio Era, they, they were making more things at home back then. Sure. Um, they, they had space and resources. So I made um, a doorbell with a doorbell battery. And um, I found online they actually make um, replica batteries from the 30s. And it, it's filled with D batteries. But it, on the outside, it looks like a 1930s battery. I got the old cloth wire. I got the doorbell button and the buzzer. And the wow. cool thing about that cool thing there is that Scorsese signed it for me. Oh, he signed it. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome. Yeah. Man, that's cool. So that's, that's like movie history. my prized possession now. Uh, yeah, whoops. <laughs> yeah, whoop. um, and, um, just more found props, I think pretty, um, prominently towards the end, right before Scorsese's cameo, actually, um, yeah. I'm typing on this typewriter, which is, I'm also a typewriter collector. So <laughs> convenient yes, there. Of course. Um, yeah. so I used my typewriter, um, for that and, um, we filmed it in two days and um, it was Jack very white. I mean, it's another story there. I, 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 I didn't know he was Jack white at first. I was talking to him like, Oh, you're a musician. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and it's Jack white. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's kind of interesting. I recommend people see this movie. It is like three and a half hours long uh, without going, I'm sure it'll be on HBO at some point soon. Um, or, or whatever Apple, I, I, my wife rented it and paid for it, which it's, you know, January, the- January 12th, 2024, it'll be streaming on Apple TV. Okay, yeah. good. All right. Now I'm angry at my wife for paying $20 to rent the movie. Uh, that'll be out in eight days, but, um, no, I'm kidding. Sorry. But, um, the portion you're in for folks who haven't seen it is very different from the entire movie. It has nothing to do really. I mean, it explains it and it talks about it's related to it, but, but like the setting and everything is totally different from the rest of the movie. So I was kind of just like, I kept being, cause I knew Paul was in it. Wells before you were in it. I was like, where is Paul? And then, and then I, and I remember also then like that day or the day before seeing that you were in it. And I was like, Oh my God, I know two guys in it. Where are they? It yeah. was like three hours. I was like, where are they? And then yeah. it's like, boom, the whole ending. It's, it's just this cool like sequence. It's yeah. Oklahoma for like three hours and 15 minutes. And you're wondering, when is a New York City radio studio going to factor into Oklahoma here? And yeah. um, it's a very, it uh, very brave and, and uh, sudden move. But it's kind of what makes exciting filmmaking is to do yeah. kind of swing swing for the fences type of move um i remember the first time i saw it in theaters i knew that some scene with me was coming but i didn't know exactly how but as yeah. soon as i knew the end of the movie was coming my heart just started pounding out of my chest which had never <laughs> happened when i was in an amc before my heart yeah, yeah, was just yeah. pounding out of my chest because i knew like i'm finally going to get to see this after by the way two and a half years <laughs> That's true. Wow. <laughs> yeah. It, Man. It, you know, when, at least when you bake a cake, you get to see it an hour later. You know, this is two and a half <laughs> years later. It was one of the oh longest God. post-productions for any Scorsese film ever. Um, I'm not a film expert, but I've read a lot about it. Um, the ending is meant to um, kind of break, um, break from reality a little bit, be a little bit surrealistic. And um, it has some anachronisms in it. Like, for example, it describes somebody's death in the 60s, but we're in the 30s telling you that somebody died in the the 60s. So it's intentionally uh, surrealistic in that way. And the purpose of being surreal in that moment, and for Scorsese himself to come up and tell you, is that he's supposed to tell you that, you know, I'm, um, I'm responsible here for just telling a tragic story with, you know, actors and makeup, you know, this is all fake. These are just actors and makeup and we're uh, sensationalizing tragedy for entertainment. And they did it back then with old radio shows and we're doing it right now. And so it's just very real moment of like, you know, 
um, you know, yeah. this is all, this is all fake. This is all fake, yeah. but the tragedy yeah. is real. And, um, um, yeah, I think it was a very yeah. beautiful way to end the movie. And, um, I would agree. And I don't think in any way, shape or form, what we are talking about now spoils or ruins the movie. Like we said, the movie is completely different, different yeah. than this end sequence yeah. that, that just kind of comes out of nowhere in a good way, but watch it, enjoy the movie, then know that Nick is over on one side of the stage. And then Paul from the Neil Peart series um, the Tony Williams series on here is in the back on the drum set. Um, and it just feels different to be like, Oh, I know those guys, which has <laughs> never happened with a Martin Scorsese movie yeah. to me. Um, I should mention so. though, if any, you know, there might be people listening who have, who've been a drummer in a movie or in a scene. Uh, they always make you, you know, fake, fake it. And in that scene, when you're watching, you can kind of be, um, informed that, um, the orchestra had pre-recorded that. And so they, they are fake playing a little bit. Paul plays the timpani like really convincingly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the cool thing with the sound effects is they had these um, antique ribbon microphones that they had rented and that were functioning and, and restored. And they told me that, you know, this microphone on your table is a functioning microphone. So when you, when you play your drum, you know, lean into the microphone because it's a real microphone. Yeah. And um, they had like really amazing uh, sound experts, a lot of which had just finished making Spielberg's West Side Story, who were uh, leveling the vintage microphones because they genuinely wanted a vintage sound, which is so cool. Yeah, that is awesome. <laughs> and then to, to pick up other instruments, they were taping microphones behind my table, taping microphones behind my instruments, just like hiding microphones everywhere. Wow. And so with the exception of uh, this Chinese Tom Tom, which I had to fake play and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of how close I can get to that head without, without <laughs> like hitting it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was proud yeah. of that. I was like, it's not going to look like, like this, <laughs> like some yeah. movies and, or you're like completely <laughs> missing. It. Yeah. Um, with the exception of this Tom Tom, they recorded everything as it was realistically on that stage it was just like the ultimate authentic cool touch and hopefully for people hearing this um they can appreciate it more knowing these fun details and uh, totally there's even a couple uh magazine reviews that mention sound effects and uh i think variety magazine called me uh did it didn't describe me they called my sound effects uh, goofy I think another review called it cheesy sound effects, but I think, I think that was supposed to be the intended feeling of, of kind of a radio shows back then, like just kind of enter turning, turning a tragedy yes. into a, a cheap entertainment. Yeah. yeah. Well, now you're a celebrity in the public eye. You got to let it roll off your back. The tabloids <laughs> and the, uh, <laughs> the celebrity magazines and stuff, but um, that's awesome, man. And in this may, this may sound cheesy to say, but I feel proud of you from someone who's been on the show, like I said, 200 episodes ago mm -hmm. to be like, you're still doing it. You're still passionate about it. You know, more than ever, you're now literally doing this in movies where you're the go-to guy. Um, so I think that's pretty amazing and something to be very proud of. Um, so, and you're, you, it's good for our community of drummers and musicians that, you know, you're kind of representing us, um, and people taking us taking taking drummers and trap mute trap instruments and performers serious so uh great job oh thank you, you know that's thank you. super cool um awesome nick well i think that's it man i think this has been an awesome episode i think it's really unique back when we recorded in 2019 i wasn't on youtube so i'm glad to have this element of it um where we can see these things now so mm -hmm. this is a really cool episode so um why don't you tell people where they can find you at your website, um, social media, whatever you want to plug here at the end. Yeah. Um, I have a, uh, a website just for, uh, traps and sound effects called vintage percussion sound Um, I don't have a uh, social media for sound effects, but I have a, um, a, a page just for my playing, uh, xylophone and percussion called tiny dot xylophone. Tiny dot xylophone. 
Um, awesome. All right, Nick. Well, I appreciate you being here. Thanks to everyone for listening and watching and, uh, hope everyone's having a great 2024 so far. And, um, that does it for this one. So thank you very much to Nick white for being here. And, uh, Nick, I appreciate it, man. Thanks for sharing all this info and the great stories and all that stuff. And, uh, we'll have you back again sometime, some other time. I'm sure. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Bart.